morning, Team FBC. My name is Stacy Godwin, and I'm your kids director. If you have your kiddos with you this morning, bring them on over to Inside Out. We have so much fun over here, and it's an environment made just for them. And if you've got your little babies with you, be sure to come and check out our nursery as well. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a great week. Team FBC and thanks for joining us. My name is Luke Winfrey and I'm the student pastor here and we have student events going on every single week. We have service every Wednesday night from 6.30 to 7.30 and small groups immediately to follow from 7.30 to 8.30. So if you're a 6th through 12th grade, come and join us and hey, all of you out there in the foyer, come on in, find your seat. It's going to be a great service. Team FBC, my name is Brennan and I am the worship and production coordinator and we are so excited that you have decided to join us this morning. We have been getting ready and we are so excited also to see what God is going to do in you and through you this service. So go ahead and take a seat and get ready for worship. Good morning, Team FBC. I am Jordan, your missions and small group pastor. If you want to sign up for small groups, go to our website, our app, our Next Steps decks, or come see me. But for now, come take a seat and let's get ready to worship. My name is Matt Taylor. I get to be one of the pastors here. And I just want to say, we are so glad that you've come to join us today. Of any place that you can be, you've chosen to be with us. And for that, we are so honored. In the next hour, you're going to experience some things, such as you're going to sing some songs. And then after that, you're going to hear some upcoming things going on at the First Baptist Church. And hopefully you can find a place where you connect in that. And then you're going to hear a message that hopefully connects with you where you are. And that is helpful to you, not just today, but for the week to come. Team FBC. Today we're going to be starting off a little bit different. Today we have the opportunity to honor and celebrate our graduates. So we can we start off services giving them a round of applause. <laughs> Team FBC with college and high school combined, we have 32 graduates from our church this year. And so of those that are high school, we have 29 high school graduates um, representing Team FBC. As you go through and as we announce them and we get an honored uh, opportunity to celebrate them, you're gonna see them going into a lot of different phases of life. Some of them have decided to go into school. Some of them have decided to go into the workforce. But I, what I want you to notice is this. God has, have a, has a calling on each and every single one of their lives. And so up here, you really are. You're looking at Christians that are going into the workforce, that are gonna become teachers, nurses, doctors, lawyers, linemen, people going in, representing Jesus Christ. And so church, yeah, give them a round. And from them, 
and me, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for the past years that you've been able to pour into them, that you have laid a foundation of what it looks like to be followers of Jesus and for pouring into them as they now pick up their cross and carry it out every single day as they enter into what people call the real world. So starting off, we're gonna go in and we're gonna honor each one. Leading us off is Miss Addie Chastain. Addie is uh, the daughter of Amy Chastain. She is planning to attend Paul Mitchell Cosmetology School in Columbia. Next up, we have Miss Ashley Baker. Ashley is the daughter of Robert and Deborah Decker and Guy Baker. Ashley is going straight into the workforce in graphic design. She's already certified, which is pretty cool. Next up, we have Caden Brown. Caden is the son of Rocky and Ethan Brown. Caden is gonna be starting as an assistant surveyor at engineering school in Springfield with plans to become a certified land surveyor. We also have, who is not here today, Cannon York. Cannon graduated from Mizzou. He is the son of John and Tammy York, and he is getting a master's degree in positive coaching and athletic leadership from the University of Missouri while finishing his football career there. Next up, the high schooler we have is Drew Trulo. Drew is going to be going to college through the MACC in Columbia, and he is the son of Michael and Rachel. Next up, we have Easton Cromer. Easton is the son of Dusty and Christine Cromer. Easton will be going to George Washington University in DC to major in political science and minor in international diplomacy. Next, we have Ethan Greenwood. Ethan is the son of Chris and Amanda Greenwood and Melissa Greenwood. Ethan is planning to attend State Fair in Sedalia, working towards his um, AA degree with an emphasis in sports journalism, then transfer to Mizzou into their sports journalism program. Side note, Ethan, I'm still gonna be texting you when weather gets bad, so you can tell me whether to cancel church or not. Next up, we have Hallie Long. Hallie is the daughter of Angie and Travis Long. Hallie will be going to the University of Missouri to pursue a career in nursing and be a labor and deliver nurse one day. Next up, we have Ms. Hannah Allen. Hannah is the daughter of Kevin and Katrina Allen. She'll be attending OTC while working full-time at First State Community Bank. Next up is a college graduate who is not here today, Hayden Brogdon. Hayden graduated from the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, and he is the son of Byron and Allie Mitchell. The next high schooler we have up is Isaiah Greenwood. Isaiah is the son of Amanda and Chris Greenwood. Isaiah will be going to State Technical College of Missouri to pursue a degree in diesel technology. Next up, and he is not here today, but it's Isaiah Waterman. Isaiah is the son of Jessica Waterman and Thomas Butler. He is going to State Fair to run Chat. Next up, we have Jake Song. Jake will be going to KU for his Master's of Science uh, uh, for paleontology, and he is going to Kansas, so all my Mizzou people in the house, can we get an M-I-Z? Thank you, appreciate that. Next up, we have Josh Wright. Josh is the son of Jason and Kelly Wright. Josh will be going to OTC and majoring in construction technology. Next up, we have Josie Pettyjohn. Josie is the daughter of John and Johnny Pettyjohn, and she'll be attending College of the Ozarks to play volleyball while also majoring in psychology. Next up, we have Callie Mack. Callie is the daughter of Rob and Melissa Mack. She'll be attending Washington University of St. Louis with a business degree. Next up, we have Keely Riggs. Keely is the daughter of Jason and Stephanie Riggs. She'll be staying in Lebanon and working at June and Beyond. Next up, and not here today, is Colton Eden. Colton is the son of Matt and Cassidy Eden. His advice for the underclassmen is listen to your parents. And all the parents said amen. Next up, who is also not here, is Corey Cromer. Corey is the daughter of Brad and Carrie Cromer, and she'll be going to Southwest Baptist University where she'll get her commercials arts degree and centered on graphic design. Next up is we have Logan Liebarger. Logan Liebarger was unable to be here today, but he is the son of Tobin and Kathy Liebarger. He's going to William Penn for a business degree. Next up, we have Mackenzie Lawrence. Mackenzie is the daughter of Crystal and Josh Lawrence, and she is getting her tech teaching degree at OTC and then transferring to a four year to finish out. She wants to do physical education and coach softball. Next up, uh, not here, is uh, my buddy Nick Wright. Nick is the son of Jason and Kelly Wright. 
Nick has gradu graduated from Southwest Baptist University, and he'll be working with the City of Independence as their cybersecurity coordinator beginning on June 6th. Next up, and also, uh, not, also not here, is Payne Jackson. Payne is the daughter of Steve and Angie Jackson, and she'll be going to the University of Missouri for Master's in Business Administration. Next up is Peyton Mitchell. Peyton is the son of Byron and Allie Mitchell. He'll be attending Pittsburgh State University to study and become a nurse practitioner. Next, we have Sam Cooper. Sam is the son of Jason and Amy Cooper. He is gonna be attending the US Military Academy at West Point, New York, and graduating as a commissioned second lieutenant serving for a minimum of five years in the US Army post-graduation. Yeah. Thanks in advance for your service. Sean Mummert is our next graduate. He's the son of Laney and Tim Mummert. Sean will also be going to the military as he's going into the United States Navy as an aviation electronics technician. Thanks in advance for your service. Next up, you get to see her almost, see her almost every Sunday morning is Miss Sierra Elmore. Sierra is uh, the daughter of Charles Elmore and Tamira Wirtz, and she's be attending OTC to study psychology. Tamara, my bad. Um, next up is Taylor Miller, who is not here today, but her, she is the daughter of Rusty and Marjean Miller. She'll be graduating with an associate's degree in elementary ed and attending MSU next year. Next up, we have Tristan Wilson. Tristan is the son of Christy and Stacy, and he'll be continuing his academic and athletic career at the University of Missouri. Next up is we have Ty O'Neill. Ty um, is the son of Robert and Krista O'Neill. Ty will be attending State Tech for civil engineering and land surveying. And then finally, we have William Palmer. William is the son of Jamie and Christine Palmer. He'll be working on, in engineering with the Durham Company Sea line Division while attending OTC part-time. At this time, would you please give your FBC graduates a round of applause. Also, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for this day. And Father, thank you for these graduates. But God, right now, this is not the end. This is only the beginning of what you have in store for them. Father, so you have already started to equip them. But God, I ask that you continue to equip them, you continue to prepare them for the, what you have planned for them to do. Because blessed is the plans that you have for them. So Father, I ask that you give them wisdom and discernment as they go forward. I'm asking that you offer your hand of protection over them. God, and you just give them an understanding of your will and your calling on their life. Father, and I ask that you would lead them in a world that is full of craziness. They be the peace in the storm. Father, I ask that you would lead them to love like nobody else, no matter where they are going. Father, and whether they're going straight into the workforce or God, if they're going into college, people are gonna be able to tell that something is different about them because of the way they love other people. So Father, I'm asking that you would work in them and through them and that they would lead this generation. Father, thank you for the memories that we were able to share with them as they were a part of us. Thank you for allowing them to share part of their lives with us as a church and let them know that we are always there for them no matter what. God, we love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. What, what's going on? Look, I've got some news. Okay, obviously. I have some big news. I'm at the edge of my seat. Let's I need go. you to buckle up. We have a brand new family room. Oh, okay.
from graduates to baby. Well, Daddy Raj, now that you become a daddy, you're, you're always late. What's up oh, with that? I have been on a journey, as some of you have seen. Are you sweating right now? I'm always sweaty. Uh, so I had the opportunity to uh, scale up on the, uh, the hallway up here where it was a castle. Everybody's waving at me. They're very celebratory. I mean, they're, they're just very friendly. And I'm not sure what in the world they have going on, but it was, it was amazing up there. I have Did to they say. try to steal Cletus? Uh, no, Cletus is fine. Oh, she, okay. He's, he's still there. Okay, he's good. There, so. Cletus is still all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, you went up through that hallway. You were supposed to leave Cletus up there. That is our pre-K hallway. It is actually, we have a nursery for our babies, but okay. we also have a pre-K hallway for our, our two-year-olds to five-year-olds. And mm. it's actually so during service, they don't have to come up here and listen to Matt preach a boring message and um, put him to sleep or whatever. They actually have a message and they have something to learn that is designed for their age, whether they be two or whether they be five. They have something just for them. They have a lot of fun games and interactives. And so it's a good place to drop off your two to five-year-olds in, in nursery kids. I mean, it was absolutely amazing up there. And by the way, if you've never been up to our pre-K hall, you've never experienced our pre-K hall, uh, it truly is an amazing experience. But when I was up there, Luke, I noticed that they are promoting this thing called Vacation Bible School. And so VBS is something that we are doing this year. And our VBS this year is gonna be June 7th through the 10th. And so that means two things. One, if your child or grandchild is able to be a part of our VBS this year, then you need to get them signed up as soon as possible. And in fact, right after this service, we will have signups in the lobby. So if you go to the lobby, go to the foyer, uh, we will get you or get your child signed up for Vacation Bible School. This is one that you will not wanna miss. But what it also means, Luke, is that when we talk about the VBS that we are gonna have this year, it is going to require a lot of volunteers. Yeah. And so if you are able to volunteer, I would encourage you just to be praying about how God is able to use you for this year's VBS 2022. And if that's something that you feel called to do, that you, you can help out in any way, shape, or form, then please go sign up, go talk to one of us, or you can go to the Team FBC app, you can go to our Facebook page and message us there. Uh, we would love to be able to get you signed up as a volunteer. And so again, this year's VBS will be June 7th through the 10th. Please do not miss that. Yeah, you mentioned the QR code, how they can sign up for VBS, but also if you are a new guest, welcome. We are so glad that you are here and joined us this morning, and we wanna know that you joined us. So in the seat back in front of you, that QR code Roger was talking about, if you take your phone out and scan it, just let us know that you were with us this morning. And then if you go out into the foyer, there's gonna be a next step desk. Roger and I, ourselves, have put together a gift bag just for you. Absolutely. I don't care what they tell you. If they try to tell you that they made the gift bags, don't listen to them. Roger and I made these gift bags just for you. So if you are a first time guest, go out there and say, hey, Roger and Luke made me a gift bag and they will hand you one. We just wanna just honor you for joining us for service this morning. If you're watching online, if you go to our Team FBC app, you can go on there and just click I'm new there or there's also a place to click baptism. But if you're also watching online, I need you to do this and everybody in the audience. It was my boy Roger's birthday yesterday and it's Pastor Matt's birthday today. Wow. So can we let him know? Uh, happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. So if you're watching online, drop in the comments, happy birthday. Maybe tell your favorite story about Roger or Matt and how much you love this. Does anybody want to guess how old I am? 38. Stop, stop, okay. stop. I'm 29, okay? Oh, okay? I got one year left and then it's 30, okay? So let me enjoy it while I can. I told them that I feel 50, but 29 uh, has never felt so good. Well, hey, we love this Sunday. We love the opportunity to continue in this sermon series. But as much as we love every single Sunday, there is something special about Baptism Sunday. And next week is our opportunity. We are doing Baptism Sunday a week earlier than we typically do. But for this uh, month's Baptism Sunday, we already have a handful of testimonies uh, of just people that have been transformed because of their salvation experience in Jesus Christ. And so right now, I wanna challenge you, whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or whether you've been a Christian your entire life, uh, I am gonna challenge you right now that if you have never taken that step into baptism, you've never made that outward expression of an inward decision, then please come talk to one of us. At the end of the message, there will be a prayer team up here. Let them know that next week is gonna be your chance. It's gonna be your opportunity to tell the entire world that you are gonna follow Jesus Christ for the rest of your life. And so again, next week will be our Baptism Sunday. Do not miss it. Yeah, we had to move it up because the 29th, that is Memorial Weekend. So a lot of you will be going on vacation, will be out of town. Wait, 
that's a nice plug. Watch us online, even if you're gone on the 29th. But on the 29th, for those that will be here, we are gonna do something special. So we've been going through this sermon series about colors, about our temperaments, and how there's different people out there. There's red, blue, green, and then my personal favorite, yellow. Um, and so there's, we all have different temperaments and why we do what we do. We're a church made up of people that have different temperaments. But we wanna be able to see that visual representation on the 29th. The 29th will be the closing of that sermon series, of that, that message that we've been going through. And on that Sunday, we want you to wear your primary color. So for me, that would be yellow. For me, it would be yellow. All right, so yours might be red, it might be green, it might be blue. You wear your color of shirt that your temperament is. And then we'll be able to see as a church what that looks like and interact and know Whose primary color is what? If you haven't taken the test, there's some tests out on our next step desk. Make sure to grab one so that we, you know how you can communicate better with your kids and people communicate better with you. And if anybody has a size large yellow shirt, uh, we are doing that in two weeks. Come talk to me afterwards. I don't think I own a yellow shirt. So. Yeah, good thing we live in yellow jacket country, so it shouldn't be that, that hard to find. It shouldn't be hard. Um, hey, service does look a little bit different today. And so we are not gonna be taking up offering right now. We are about to worship, and as soon as the video plays after worship, at that time, the ushers will come forward, pass the offering plates, and at that time, we'll be taking up your tithe, or his tithe and our offering. So at this time, if you would, everybody stand as we worship our Heavenly Father together. Don't forget Cletus. I'm not gonna forget Cletus.
expectations for myself. Do you? Yeah. I'm very sensitive. I'm like a perfectionist. Yeah. I just kind of feel a little bad for myself. I like to be early rather than late. I want A's in all classes. I like to be safe than sorry. I don't like to mess up. What happens when you do? I can be kind of part of myself. Yeah. What do you think about like big crowds? or noise or anything. I'm not a big fan of noise. Yeah? I have a very high nervous system. Okay. I, I'm nervous about going to school, nervous mm -hmm. about, like, usually I would just wake up and then get all stressed out. What is your favorite thing to do? Probably to read a book. Really? Yeah, I really like reading books. I read National Geographic. You do? I bet you it gives you a lot of information. I know the tallest building in the world. What is it? The Burj Khalifa. I like the Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. I read the whole series in a week. Fishing, swimming, soccer, guitar, makeup. Wow. Just... Fishing? Yeah. Yeah, what just you thinking when you're fishing? Good thoughts, positive thoughts. Yeah. Just relaxing a bit, just <laughs> waiting until I catch something. <laughs> and you're good just waiting, because yeah. you're doing something you like, right? You seem kind of like a rule follower, are you? Um, yes. Yeah. What if somebody's breaking any rule? I think they should be following the rule. Mm hmm But it's, I'm not them and I can't make the decision yeah. for them. What do you think you want to do when you grow up? Probably like an engineer. Like, really? Yeah. Like, I really like coming up with ideas and mm -hmm. coming up with, like, and building things and stuff. Um, what do you get in trouble for? <laughs> not listening very much. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, when I'm focused and zoned out on something, I mm -hmm. don't listen at all. Yeah. Putting hands on my sister's mm -hmm. school, not being quiet. Um, really? Yeah. What are you doing not to be quiet? That surprises well, me. I was just doing examples. I, don't, okay. I really do, do be quiet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. When you get my age, you start counting backwards. Amen to that. Thank you very much. Hey, I got so caught up in our worship, I forgot to plug myself in. And so I'm glad everybody can hear me. I requested that song this week. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought you were. Some of you, you came to church today. And you need to be reminded of that. Some of you right now are facing some big things in your life, and they're intimidating. They are threatening your peace. They are threatening your joy. And you need to be reminded this morning that he is bigger than you thought you were. And I think the more you walk with Christ, if you're a Christ follower, the longer your journey becomes and the more you lean into your faith, I think we become more and more convinced of that, that he is bigger than what we thought he was. And I think ultimately, when we stand before God, and we see everything from heaven's vantage point, we will be undeniably convinced, oh my goodness, he is bigger than we ever thought he was. But to take the thought, and this is the reason I asked them to play the song, but to take that thought, the God who's bigger than you thought he was, the God of all creation, I want you to take this in this morning, he understands you. He gets you. I'm so overwhelmed by that thought. That the God of all creation, he understands you. There's some people in the house today. Right now, you might be in a season in your life and you're thinking very few understand me. There might be some here today and you might be wondering, does anybody get me? And you need to know your heavenly father, he does. He gets you, he understands you. And as the psalmist would say, that God who's bigger than we thought he was, he is still mindful of us. Who am I, the psalmist said, that, that he would be mindful of me, the God who's bigger than I thought he was. Today, we're gonna be talking to the blues in the house, the blue temperaments. And if there's a question that the blue temperaments, our blue kids and our friends and our blue spouses and our colleagues, our grandkids, if they have a question of their heart, it is that, do you know me? Do you get me? Do you understand me? And so for every blue in the house, I want you to know your heavenly father, he understands you. He gets you. You say, well, I'm not a blue and I appreciate that the same. I do, I appreciate that our heavenly father, when I feel misunderstood, when I feel maybe in moments where no one gets me, 
he understands. Me, he understands you. You might be here today for the first time and maybe you're part of just supporting the graduates and you might be wondering, well, what have I stepped into? All of these colors, what are you guys talking about? We're in the middle of the series entitled, I said this, you heard that. It's a study by this expert in this field. Her name is Kathleen Eidelman. And what she has done is she has broken down for us the four temperaments, and you'll see where we'll go from it here today. But we've already discussed each week, we've now done yellows, we've now done greens. Today, we're gonna focus on blues. And what temperaments are, they're much different than maybe what you have heard in the similar fashion of personalities. Personalities change. Personalities throughout seasons and maybe through trauma, traumatic events, hormones, personalities can change. But temperaments, that never changes. Your temperament is hardwired by God. You had it from the time you were born. You didn't get a vote. And no matter how long your life is, you are not changing your temperament. And your temperament is what you see all of life through. And your temperament is what you speak out of. How many times have you, in love, said to a child, in love, said to a friend, something that eventually you found out actually hurt them? And you're like, I didn't mean that. And probably what you were doing, you were speaking out of what came natural to you as your temperament, and they, with their own temperament, understood it differently. So this whole series is about helping us understand, especially our blue kids, especially our blue grandkids, but this goes for everybody, and my prayer is that we as a community that we might become better at speaking fluently in colors that are not our own. You know very well how to speak in your color. What you may not know is how to speak words that will actually convey the message of your heart, that I love you and you are important to me, and how you say that to a certain temperament will determine whether you're successful or not. So the focal verse for the whole series is found in Ephesians chapter four, verse 29, and the Apostle Paul says it this way, to a church very much like Team FBC, full of humans, and there is glory in that, and yet full of humans, we're never gonna be perfect. And all the contention and all the challenges that come when humanity bumps against humanity, Paul's saying here, do not let any unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth. Now again, if you're new here today, you might be wondering, what does unwholesome words mean? These are not curse words. These are not wordy dirties, as my grandmother used to say. Unwholesome words, these are anything that you can say to someone that would actually take away from their identity, their wholeness, or speak against the potential that God is working in their lives. We can do that on purpose, but I would say for the most of us, we've done that unintentionally, but unintentional hurt is still absolutely. Do not let any unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth, but only that which builds others up. You've heard maybe before, another psalmist said, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. There are some of you today, there was words spoken to you when you were younger, and here you are as an adult, and it did something to you. It actually marked your path. And some of you have responded well to that, some of you have been crushed by that, but you are still living, some of you are, with words that were spoken to you and something got written on your heart when you were a young person, and it has been a measure of overcoming your entire life trying to get over what was spoken to you at a vulnerable time. Our words have the power to bring death, but they also have the power to bring life. Meaning if your past had been charted because somebody believed in you and they actually said it out loud. And because you didn't believe in yourself at the time, you hung on to their words, you allowed God to write it on your heart, and today you're a different person because somebody believed in you and they actually spoke it out loud. They built you up. The Bible says, as we do this, we need to do it according to their needs, not yours, theirs, and this is where the whole temperament study comes in. This is where we need to learn, hey, what does a yellow child need? What does a green child need to hear? What are some things I need to stay away from as I speak to my blue temperament son? Or what's some things that I need to make sure I say in the right way to my blue temperament granddaughter? All of this we're gonna cover today. So I'm telling you, if you're a blue in the house, you're gonna listen like never before. But I promise you, if you have a blue son or daughter, a blue granddaughter, grandson, if you have right now as a teacher somebody in your mind that you might be thinking in your classroom, they're blue, somebody on your team that you coach, you're thinking they might be a blue after today, I promise you before God, they are begging that you listen well today. They're hoping you don't zone out for their sake, 
because this might be their ticket to finally being understood by you that might have seemed challenging to them in the years gone by. Throughout the weeks, I've shown you this little graph. We have our extroverts and our introverts. The yellows and the reds, they're our extroverts. That does not mean they like people more than the greens and blues. That simply means they process their thoughts out loud. That means they speak before thinking. And some of you have been the worst for that. They think their thoughts outside, they process, they spitball, and they do really good in their strengths of talking in collaboration with others. The greens and the blues, however, these are introverts. These are people that will speak less, but they think deeper. They're not the first ones to jump into the discussion. As a matter of fact, they'll be the last ones to jump into the discussion, but you really wanna know what they're thinking after they've had time to process their thoughts inwardly. Also on the next one, you see here, yellow and greens, these are people-oriented people. If they ever have to choose between a relationship, a person, or a task in a particular day, seven times a week and twice on Sundays, they will pick people over task. The reds and the blues, these are high-functioning people. Reds and blues can accomplish a whole lot, but they are task over people, and they too, seven times a week and twice on Sundays, they will choose task before people. So today I wanna share with you some strengths of blues, because you're here today and you're like, say, man, I haven't taken the test. And again, here's what we've learned. You guys are excited about what you're learning because every week we buy a whole nother package of books and we think, clearly this is enough. We have already sold out again. So just know, next week we will have a whole new case of books so that you can come, you can spend your $10, it's a worthy investment, they cost a whole lot more than that, but because of the generosity of the First Baptist Church, we're able to give it to you at a much reduced price. We want you and we want the people in your family to understand their colors, take the test, you can find out. But today, before you even take the test, with these strengths and weakness, you might say, wait a second, honey, well, wait a second, I think my son, I think, I think, I think this is where we have misunderstood in times past. Here's the strengths of a blue. Number one, they're creative and they're very artistic. Some of the greatest performers, some of the greatest musicians, some of the greatest actors have a blue temperament. They are extremely artsy. They have that inclination when everybody else is kind of just trying to remember what maybe they've seen or heard and copy someone else. These guys, they are a deep well of new ideas, fresh ideas. They're creative, they're artistic. Number two, they are empathetic and they are sensitive. They are empaths. See, it's one thing to be sympathetic to somebody. Sympathy says, I'm sorry, you're hurting. That's sympathy. Here's empathy. I am sorry you're hurting, and because you're hurting, I too am hurting. That's empathy. Now, blues in the house, you would say, well, that's a blessing, but you would also be honest and say, that's also a curse, because this means you feel what other people don't feel. I got blue friends, I got blue family members, they can read a room, they can walk into a room, and they can read you who they may not even know, but they feel, they somehow has the sixth sense, they pick up on what you are feeling. And some of my blue friends, I'll pull them aside in the room and I'll see them tearing up, I'm thinking, who hurt your feelings? And I'm thinking, did I think out loud before, or speak out loud before I thought? I'm like, are you okay? And to my blue friends, they'd say, yeah, I'm just, I just, I'm just emotional, I'm just emotional right now. You know what they're really saying? I'm picking up and what's being said and I'm picking up the emotions. These people are great with sensitivities. They got antennas, they got radars. It makes them incredibly emotionally intelligent. I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Number three, they are organized and they are focused. Our blues, they are rule followers. They wanna know what the rules are. They wanna know what the expectations are and they fit within that world. That is safety to them. And as you're gonna see one of their innate needs, they long to be safe. They are very organized and they are extremely focused. They are lists. They have high functioning capabilities because they are so laser focused. Compare that maybe to a yellow parent who might be all over the place, but having a good time doing it, right? <laughs> to a blue, that's not really all that safe. Blues are not spontaneous people. They like a plan and they think a plan will work if you'll work the plan, but you better stick to the plan because in their minds, there's an order and there's a focus. Number four, 
They are high achievers because they are task over people. Blues can work circles around so many of us. I'm so grateful for the blues I've had a chance to serve shoulder to shoulder with. I'm so grateful for the blues on our staff right now. I'm telling you what, they accomplish a great deal. For the majority of blues in my life, all I need to know, do you know what needs to be done? If they say yes, I don't think about it again. Why? I don't think about details. Two, they do, and I just need to know, are you on it? If they're on it, they're going to come through for you in their strengths. And number five, last year, they are great problem solvers. My mom used to say this growing up, problems are meant to be solved, Matt. Problems are meant to be solved. Some of you just need to hear that. Here's Ruth Ann. Problems are meant to be solved. Blues are great problem solvers. You know why? Because they are seven steps ahead of most of us. Now, right now, that just really encouraged some of the blues in the house. They're like, I'm so glad somebody just said that. They are steps ahead of all of us. Why? Because they're thinking details. They're thinking unforeseen problems. Now, that's a great strength. But if you're not careful, you also have weaknesses. In weaknesses, somebody, a, a, a yellow can come up to a blue and says, I got a great idea, I got a great idea. This is gonna be so much fun, this is gonna be great. And they tell you the idea, and a blue hears that, and a blue, on their mind, sirens are going off. The yellow wants to hear, wow, that's awesome. But a blue oftentimes is saying, wow, they say, how? How do you plan on pulling that off? Because they're thinking the details and they're thinking in all what I foresee, there's a lot that you're probably not thinking about. Incredible problem solvers and incautiousness can protect you from making problems. But as every temperament has strengths, every temperament has weaknesses. Here's one of the weaknesses, they are moody. If you got a blue child, you know how this works. Unbeknownst to you, nothing has changed but the attitude of your child. They can be moody, they can be lippy, snippy, pouty. You know there is something wrong and you ask them like, hey, are you okay? And they ain't gonna tell you, but they're gonna show you and they'll keep you guessing. And if you're really close to a yellow, I just tell you loves, or yellows love to guess. Says no yellow. Number two, they lack self-confidence. If you could get inside the mind of your blue child, if you could get inside of their thoughts and what they say to themselves, they're pretty hard on themselves. Blues doubt themselves. Your blue son, I just want you to know he's, he's pretty tough on himself. And so honestly, they don't, they don't need you as a parent, and they don't need me as a, as a, as a friend or, or a parent or pastor. They don't need you coming down so hard on them. Why? Because they're already down on themselves. They don't need a pile on. They lack self-confidence because they understand what the standards are. They understand, hey, the plan was supposed to accomplish this, and when it doesn't, they got nobody to blame but themselves. And trust me, they blame themselves, and through time, it erodes their confidence. Number three, in their weaknesses, they are pessimistic. Now again, if you're a yellow parent and you've got a blue child, yellows, I mean, you wake up on the sunny side of the mountain every morning, right? Like life is just great. Like it, it is wonderful. The glass is half full and, and, and if you're a follower of Jesus, man, you, you have a God can attitude. Blues and their weaknesses, they are pessimistic people. I mean, it's kind of like Eeyore. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Might as well go eat worms. You're like, suck it up, buttercup. The sky's not falling. And easy for you to say, maybe from your temperament, in their weaknesses as a blue, the sky might feel like indeed it is falling. Number four here. They are judgmental. I told you they have negative self-talk, but being judgmental, they oftentimes are suspicious of others. Now again, if you're a yellow parent, as we learned a few weeks ago, you're an optimist. I mean, you're always thinking to yourself, like, hey, I'm gonna give them another chance. 
hey, he, he failed before, but it, it's a new day, and, and everybody deserves a second chance and a third chance, fourth chance. Do blues, you don't get another chance. You know why? Because you've shown yourself not to be safe. You've shown yourself, I can't trust you. And so as a result, they lean towards suspicion. They lean towards judgment. Now, if you are friends as a blue with a yellow, you will know something before I finish saying this where I'm going with it. Where yellows believe first and believe most and get their feelings hurt, blues will believe last. There's something in every blue that you know innately you ought to be a little bit more believing in people. Like there is something in you, like you are about self-protecting in your weakness, but there is something inside of you. Innately, you know. You ought to give people a little bit more deference. You ought to believe a little bit more rather than always working from suspicion or judgment. And then number five, too focused on the mistakes. Let me tell you something about our blue kids. Blue kids, you got an exam coming up? Um, you, you ain't winging it. Your blue children don't wing nothing, right? I mean, they, 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 they understand the standard, and as a blue, they're gonna do everything they can to prepare for such tests. And in their minds, they might be thinking, in strength, I'm gonna do well. I should ace this test. They take the test to get the grade back. It's an 89. As a yellow, I'm thinking, rock on, man. That's good. Woo! As a blue, that crushes them. Because again, they think, I should have aced this. There's no reason whatsoever that I should have not done extremely well, but they're focused on their mistakes. That's in their weakness. And here's the great news. Whether you're blue, or yellow, red, green, you have a choice. You have a choice. You can walk in your strengths or you can choose to walk in weakness. And even in a given day, you could do both. But I'm just telling you, you are 100% in control of what you choose to walk in. Just because it's a weakness, you don't have to. That's why we say our colors are not our excuses. They're just explanations for why we excel in certain areas and why we are challenged in others. Explanations. So as you look in the scriptures, and since I've done this two years ago, I see everything in color. I see you in color. So the boys mentioned on the last Sunday in May, we're all gonna wear our colors. And so find your shirt, whatever color you are. But I would say if I've been able to be your pastor for some time, I will probably be able to tell you your color before you wear your shirt. You know why? Because I get you. I see everything now in colors. I introduce myself in colors. And when you tell me who you are, even today, I met some people for the very first time. I met a husband, met a wife, and met some kids. <laughs> I can tell you almost already what colors they are. One little kid, he's so excited. Give me five, he's, give me a five. I'm like, you are yellow, you need to calm down, son. <laughs> There's another little kid. I'm like, here, give me a five there, big guy. He's like, mm, turns into his mom. Now, he's either a blue or a green, but he ain't a yellow, and that's not a red. These are temperaments. As I look through the scriptures, you see the stories of different people. I can't help but to see, oh, you must be. And today, I'm gonna show you one that after I say it, you're gonna be like, of course he's a blue. His name is David. He's referred to as the king. He was the most popular, most renowned king in all of Jewish history. He was the second king to ever occupy the throne. But as a blue, there's some things you might know about him. Number one, incredibly creative, very artistic. He, he was a musician, he wrote a lot of poetry, he had deep thoughts, spent time alone, recharged his batteries alone. But as you're gonna see today, he was oftentimes overlooked. And not just overlooked by peers, he was overlooked by his own family. And there's some blues, you got siblings, and maybe you had a yellow sibling and a red sibling, and they seem to take up all the attention in the room, and you seem to be looked over, picked over, and maybe you even were tempted to think you were left over. Gotta be very careful with our blues, it's an easy trap to see themselves in. David was one of these guys. I'm gonna tell you a little about his family today. The Bible says here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Bible said, the Lord said to Samuel, now Samuel, he's the prophet in Israel. He's, he is the man. Everybody knows Samuel. He comes with stature. He says to Samuel, the Lord, how long will you mourn 
for Saul because at this time Saul had been rejected by God. Since I've rejected him as king over Israel, Samuel was grieved by this. He was hurt by this, that, that the choice of Saul was not going to measure up like he thought. So he says here in the remaining verse one, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Now Jesse is the father of David. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So what you're about to see and what we're about to read, it wasn't a good idea. This was God's idea. He says here in verse four, Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they saw him. They asked, do you come in peace? Because again, as the prophet of God is coming, oh my goodness, does God have a good message for us? Or does God have a message of judgment for us? Pray tell, tell us now so we can brace for it. He says here in verse five, Samuel replied, yes, I come in peace. They were like, Phew. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves, which simply means get your heart right, get ready, we're gonna do this together and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse six, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. He said, well, who's Eliab? Eliab was the eldest son of Jesse. He was the firstborn. Probably in the house, he was the alpha. There was nobody greater probably than Eliab. Just to look at him, you would say, you are a man of stature. You got great things going for you. You got a future, do you not, boy? Eliab was brought, and when Samuel saw him, he said, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. What he's basically saying is, surely you are the king. <laughs> God's making a second pick in the king. You're gonna be that pick, aren't you? Eliab. The Bible says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart for every blue in the house who may have felt looked over, picked over, left over where the world judges from the outside, even Samuel, the prophet, was caught up in that problem. The Lord reminds Samuel that day, and he reminds us this day, I don't look at people for the way other people look at people. I look at your heart. I see you. I hear you. I get you. I understand you. That is good news, should be good news for all of us, but especially the blues. Be comforted, your heavenly father, he looks at your heart. Next verse, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. And here's the problem with that. Jesse did not have seven sons. Jesse had eight eight sons. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? I mean, David was so overlooked by his own dad, forget society, by his own dad, flesh and blood. When the prophet says, bring all your sons out, Jesse thought so little of David. He was so obscure in the family that he didn't even bring them out to meet the prophet. Why do so? Such a waste of time. So dad conjectured. Are these all the sons you have? Notice the response of Jesse. Jesse says, well, they're still the youngest, but he's tending sheep. You ever received a, a compliment sandwich that seemed to be lacking the compliments on both the bun up top and the bun below? It's just kind of a back door, like, what did you say? Oh, no, you didn't. Like, have you ever, like, somebody said something to you? Not like overtly, but, but enough, you're like, I think you just put me down. Well, there is still the youngest, but, hey, Samuel, he's tending sheep. Like, that's what he does. 
He's a shepherd. I didn't bring him out. And now you know why. Because he doesn't have a lot of capacity. Being a blue, he was an introvert. He processed his thoughts inwardly. And maybe all of his brothers, where they're doing it outwardly, he was lost in the shuffle and relegated. Go take care of your sheep. And there's another story in the Bible where David will come to his brothers and his brothers will actually say to him, hey, why aren't you taking care? And they say, of your few sheep. I mean, it's another dig. You're not just a shepherd. You're a shepherd of a small, few flock. So I told you, God understands you. God gets you. God sees your heart. God saw David's heart. It says over here in 1 Samuel chapter 12, 13, he's talking about, but now your kingdom will not endure. God is speaking here to Saul. The Lord has sought out a man, and follow this, after his own heart. And he's appointed him ruler of his people. You say, how old was David around this time? He was still a teenager. Like that teenage boy that shepherded, as his brothers would say, his few small sheep. God says, because I don't look on the outside, I look at the heart. I see a man after my own heart. I'm gonna see a man there that's gonna lean into his faith, that's gonna walk with me, not in pride, but humility. And I can shepherd him as he shepherds my people, Israel. That's a pretty validating story for every blue in the house. And for every parent of a blue child, listen, it is something that you, I, we, we need to be very mindful and careful that those who are so easily not heard, not seen because everybody else is taking up attention in the room, you wanna lean into your blues. They need it more than you realize. Every color, every temperament has needs, innate needs, and don't get mad at them, but these are the way they're wired. They didn't ask to be a blue. But for every blue, what they're looking for in relationship is, number one, safety. And I'd say that's probably the biggest one. They wanna know, are you safe? That's why if you let them down, that's why if they do put trust in you and you show yourself not to be trustworthy, that's why they are next to impossible to open up their heart again to you. Why? Because they long for safety. So blues, they will go through life and they won't have a whole ton of friends. But the friends they do have, they will go deep with, and they probably will be lifelong friends. You know why? Because they've learned there's this group of people I know I can be safe with. Time has told me, time has convinced me you are safe. And when a blue feels safe, I'm just telling you, they will open up their heart naturally. They won't even have to try. They'll just open up their heart naturally. So the long for, their innate need is safety. Number two, support. They wanna be supported. They wanna know, are you with me? Can I count on you? One of the wonderful things you can say to a blue is if they are moody, if they do get lippy, you can say to them, hey, when you're ready to talk about this, I'll be here and I'll help in any way you need. That is wonderful support. That speaks the language of a blue. Number three, sensitivity. I told you how much they are empaths. They are so incredibly sensitive. They feel what other people feel. Well, if they do, don't you know they would want that back to themselves? We're reading right now in our staff um, this new book by Tim Elmore. It's called The Eight Paradoxes of Great Leadership. And um, as they were talking in the intro of it, he was saying there's a difference between IQ and EQ. I'm saying, well, tell me what you're talking about here. IQ, that's, you know, your intelligence. Some have higher than others. There's EQ, and that's emotional intelligence. He says in the book, he says, we have heard the cliche, and it is oftentimes true. So many of the times the A-plus students in the classroom will eventually working for the C students, peers in their careers. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Why is that? 
And he says, because if you are so off the chart smart, oftentimes you put your, all your marbles in that one basket. But if you're like someone like me and you ain't that smart, well, then you learn to manage and go through life picking up on emotional cues, visible, nonverbal communication from other people to help you with the intelligence that you may lack. And that will take you very, very, very far in life. He says, when I teach college classes, I tell them, while you're in school, 75% of your success is gonna depend upon your IQ, 25% will be determined by your EQ. But in life, it's gonna be just the opposite. Blues, incredibly sensitive, they're empaths, they long for it themselves, they pick up on cues, verbal, nonverbal, body language, that's what they want themselves. Number four, space and silence. You ever try to talk to a blue when they're not ready to talk? How'd that work out for you? Yeah? I mean, some of you, I just saw your hands raised. Mm, I've been there. Mm-hmm, got that. And see, someone like me as a yellow, I, I, I wanna deal with the problem now. Again, Ruth Ann told me, problems are meant to be solved. And better now than ever, right? Because I'm thinking, if we don't solve it now, it can grow legs. It will get away from you. You get me, don't you, yellows? Oh, yeah. Blues, you can't stand me in those moments, do you? Because you don't want to talk about it right now. It's not safe for you to talk about it right now. You still have to process, and you do that by yourself, not in collaboration with a yellow or red spouse, friend, parent. So you want space and silence. So the best thing you can say, again, to your blue child, listen, I know you're upset right now, honey. Take your time. I'll be here when you're ready. And when you are, we can chat. I'm just telling you, it'll just make a blue so happy. It really will just do wonders. I close with this. Here's some quick ways that you can encourage a blue. Here's some just quick statements that make them feel so good that would build them up. You are so emotionally smart. Your friends are so lucky to have you. Listen, not everybody's emotionally smart. I meet people all the time that's emotionally dumb. They're not smart. <laughs> so sorry. They're dumb. Sorry. As I've gotten older, I've, I've been told there's words you can't say anymore. I'm, I'm trying to learn. All my educational friends are just staring me down. I feel it. I just feel it. I'm so sorry. See, that wasn't emotionally smart on my part. Look at there. I, that's good case in point. I, I just was emotionally dumb. So tell them, man, you're so emotionally smart. Your friends are so lucky. Number two, I love your ideas. You are so creative. And that just speaks, speaks their value, speaks their worth. Number three here. I love your plan. You have thought through everything. And that just speaks to the way they're wired and what they know they're good at and what you're doing. You're affirming that as a parent. And I love this plan. You, you've, there's, there's nothing you haven't thought of. And then number four down here, I trust you. You are always so honest. I can trust you. You're safe with me. You are safe to me. And to a blue who value safety in relationships, you're like, I'm glad I could give that gift. For every blue in the house, you're gonna know where I'm going with this as we land the plane. The heart of the blue, they ask this question. Do you understand me? Do you get me? Do you know me? For every parent in the house who's got a blue child, you understand a little bit better just in light of what you just heard. For every grandparent that has a blue granddaughter, grandson, you understand a little bit better. For the teachers, to the coaches, your classmates, your players, you get them a little bit better. But for every blue, I want you to know your Heavenly Father, he does get you. He understands you. He's always understood you. And he cares about you. He affirms you because he made you. And you are one of a kind. Your worth, your value is off the chart. The kingdom of God has expanded because of what has been placed upon your shoulders and you have served so well. And this life is gonna be better as you choose to walk in your strengths and everybody you come in contact will benefit from it. 
I'm gonna ask you, would you bow your heads with me as we close out here? If you're here this morning and you heard this talk and you're like, you know, that's comforting to know that, that he understands me. That's comforting. Well, he does. He understands you and your strengths. He understands you and your weaknesses. And because you are like the rest of us in the sense that you are human, though different colored, you are a struggler like the rest of us in our own humanity. The Bible would call that sin. And the Bible says that sin separates us from our Heavenly Father because he is holy. But God did not create you to live separated from him. God created you so that you might know him, that you might come to him and in him find the life that this world could never, ever, ever offer. So in the quietness of this moment, you just need to know that you are loved. And you are loved so much that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a life that you never could live, and he died a death he did not deserve. The punishment that your sins and my sins deserve, Jesus says, I will take that upon myself. You wanna know how much you're loved? The innocent of all innocent men the one who never knew sin, the one who didn't have to, chose to, because he loved you, to suffer on your behalf so that instead of receiving the wrath of God that your sins and my sins deserve, that you can receive the grace of God that your heart and soul longs for. Knowing about it mentally is not enough. You've got to experience that in your heart. You've got to be, as Jesus says, born again. How does that happen? Right now in your seat, it could happen. All it takes is a humble heart, believing that what I just said is true, and believing that Jesus, when he died upon the cross, he wasn't just dying for the sins of the world, he was dying for your sins. When you understand it's personal, then faith becomes personal, it becomes real. And that is how you enter into a relationship with God. Everybody here today, you are creations of God, but you only become a child of God when you are born into the family, when you are born again, when you put your faith in Jesus and him alone, trusting no one and nothing else to make you right with God. Some of you have done that just recently. Some of you have been thinking about that. Why not today? Why not now? You can call upon the Lord and you can ask him to come into your heart, to believe on him, and to ask him to forgive, to give his life to you. If you let them know today, I wanna start following you. There's gonna be a prayer team up here at front before you leave. I want you to find one of these guys or gals and say, hey, today was my day. I made that decision. I prayed that prayer. In, in my own heart, I prayed. I, today's my day. They'll know what you meant by that. For every parent, influencer, who works and lives and loves the blues, may we take what we've learned. May we ask God to write upon our hearts that we speak fluently in the language of blue to those who need it the most. We're gonna do something different today. We're gonna close by singing this one last song. We sang in the beginning. I've asked them to lead us as we close out today. So would you stand to your feet right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, as we sing before we leave, would you please write this upon our hearts that you are the God who is bigger than we thought and you is that God you are mindful of us. You understand me. Drive this point home. May we not miss it. May it not be lost on us. I ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Sing with us.
understand me. You understand me, God. You understand. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you guys back next Sunday.